the author of The Things They Carry, Tim O'Brien, completed a 13-month tour of duty in Vietnam, coming home in 1970. This short story, which is a part of a larger collection of stories called The Things They Carried, um, was written or based upon his experiences during, during the war. One of the things that um, you probably noticed as you read through the um, short story was that the story is divided into many parts. You can actually see blank lines between the different sections in the short story. That is by design. And in each of those parts, we get retellings of some of the same stories. One is about Ted Lavender's death. The other is about all the different things that the soldiers carried. And so the question that I have and I want to pose to you is why? Why do you think this story is divided into all of these parts? Um, what is the point? What do you think O'Brien is trying to do? The events of this story basically take place over two days, but yet it seems that this is a much longer period of time that we're reading about. And I think the retellings contribute to that. But I want to go through each section and break down several things that are happening in the sections. And so hopefully that we can try to figure out why um, Tim O'Brien structures the story the way that he does. So in that very first section, we learned that Jimmy Cross carried letters from Martha and he pretended and he was distracted. So Martha is his love from back home and he wasn't completely sure that um, she was in love with him, but he liked to pretend that she was. And then he admits early in this first section that he is distracted by Martha. And then the sex second section, we learned that the soldiers carried necessities. And those necessities ranged from can openers, pocket knives, wristwatches, dog tags, and helmets, to clothing, dope, condoms, comic books, and even an illustrated New Testament. So whatever the soldiers felt like were necessary for them, they, they these are the things that they carried. So if you look, it's, this is a long list of things um, that these guys are carrying. We also learn, find out here in this second section early in the story, the first mentioned or mention of Lavender's death. And what we find is that he was scared, carried tranquilizers, and was shot in the head outside of the village of Tonke in mid-April. So we know that these events are taking place in mid-April. So we get that first mention of his death. In section three, we get, um, we learned that the soldiers carried photos and of course Cross carried a photo of Martha. Section four, what they carried was partly a function of rank, partly a field specialty. So um, Cross carried certain items because he was the platoon leader and the lieutenant. Um, Mitchell Sanders carried the radio, which was 26 pounds. Um, it weighed 26 pounds. We learned what the medic, Rat Kylie, carried, all the things a medic might need. Henry Dobbins carried the M60, which was the machine gunner, and it weighed 23 pounds unloaded but between 10 and 15 pounds of ammunition, he also had draped over his shoulders. And then you learn through that section what others of them carried. And O'Brien makes a point here of specifically telling us how much of these things weighed. So we're starting to get an understanding of the weight that these guys carried every day, the physical weight that they carried every day. And then we get Lavender's death being retold. We learned that he was scared again, that he, car he, was, he carried 34 rounds when he was shot and killed outside Tom K. And Kiowa just describes it as just boom and then down. So boom, down. Um, 
as he was shot. So just a very, again, not much information about Lavender's death, maybe a little bit more, but not that much. And then we get, for the first time, Cross blaming himself because he says Lavender died because he was thinking about Martha instead of his men. In the next section, they carried standard weapons or whatever seemed appropriate as a means of killing or staying alive. So you get a whole list there of the different things that they, that they carried. In section six, we know that Jimmy Cross carried a good luck pebble that he received from Martha earlier in the month of April. So this happened before Lavender died, but yet we're told about it later. So we're definitely not following a linear narrative here. And then what they carried varied by mission. This is in section seven. And here we learn probably the most about Lavender's death. And it happened during tunnel duty. So what would happen during tunnel duty is that there were tunnels all over the country because this is how the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong moved supplies and men under all these underground tunnels. So as these platoons were, were patrolling the country, one of the things that they had to do was see if there was anything in anyone or anything in these tunnels. Um, if there were people, they would take them. If there were things and of value, they would take those. If not, they would just blow everything up. They would blow the tunnel um, at the end regardless to make sure that the Viet Cong were not able to move goods through them anymore. So they took, they drew numbers for who would actually go into the tunnel each day. And on this particular day, Lee Strunk was the one who drew the unlucky number 17 to go into the tunnel. Well, while Lee Strunk is in the tunnel and everyone is looking out for him, understand that this would have been the most dangerous job of the day to go down into the tunnel and set the mine. Ted Lavender popped a tranquilizer and went off to pee. And he was shot in the head on his way back. So here we have Lavender doing something very innocuous, going to the bathroom and he gets killed while Lee Strunk performing the dangerous task is fine. So we get a real, real sense of irony here that exemplifies the, the pointlessness of the death during war, according to O'Brien. If you can be killed going to the bathroom, Clearly, there is no point in that. So just that juxtaposition between Lee Strunk's job and Lavender going to pee shows the irony of, of war and the dangers around war. And then we know, again, that Cross was thinking about Martha. He could not bring himself to worry about matters of security. He was beyond that. He was just a kid at war um, and in love. So again, Cross feeling like he's thinking about her instead of taking care of his people. In section eight, the things they carried were determined to some extent by superstition. A good luck pebble, a rabbit's foot, even a thumb of a Viet Cong corpse so that someone carried with them as a good luck charm. Section nine, we hear that they, we find out that they carried the whole atmosphere of Vietnam and the sky, the atmosphere, the humidity, the monsoons. And then you get to a really significant section and I'm gonna read all of it. By daylight, they took sniper fire. At night, they were mortared, but it was not battle. It was just the endless march. 
village to village, without purpose, nothing won or lost. They marched for the sake of the march. They plodded along slowly, dumbly, leaning forward against the heat, unthinking. All blood and bone, simple grunts, soldiering with their legs, toiling up the hills and down into the paddies and across the rivers and up again and down just humping one step and then the next and then another but no volition no will because it was automatic it was anatomy and the war was entirely a matter of posture and carriage the hump was everything a kind of inertia a kind of emptiness a dullness of desire and intellect and conscience and hope and human sensibility their principles were in their feet. Their calculations were biological. They had no sense of strategy or mission. They searched the villages without knowing what to look for, not caring, kicking over jars of rice, frisking children and old men, blowing tunnels, sometimes setting fires and sometimes not, then forming up the moving, forming up and moving on to the next village than other villages where it would always be the same. They carried their own lives. Their pressures were enormous. And so in this section here, um, you really get a sense of what their everyday looked like. And with words like endless march, village to village, without purpose, nothing won or lost. They marched for the sake of the march. They know they had no sense of strategy or mission, and it would always be the same. So day after day after day, they would get up and they would do the exact same thing. In section 10, this is where the chopper is taking Lieutenant Cross's, is taking Lavender away. So after the chopper took Lavender away, Lieutenant Jimmy Cross led his men into the village of Tonkay and they burned everything. So they take their revenge on the people in the village for Lavender's death. Now, just so that you understand, North Vietnamese and Viet Cong soldiers hid um, in plain sight in these villages. And some of these soldiers were as young as 15 or 16 years old. So it was very hard for American troops, when they entered a village, to know who was the enemy and who was innocent. And so that's why you have these descriptions of them entering the villages, of them pillaging a little bit, and of them burning. If they got a tip that there, was, there were VC, Viet Cong, hiding out in a particular village, well then that's what they were required to do. So the enemy was everywhere and the enemy was nowhere all at the same time. And it created a very, very difficult situation for these American soldiers. And so they reacted in ways sometimes that we might question, but if you understand the endlessness of it, the pointlessness of it that they were experiencing every single day, it makes it a little bit more um, identifiable with an action that you might think would be quite horrible. And then we find out too that Cross felt shame. He hated himself. He had loved Martha more than his men. And as a consequence, Lavender was now dead. So we see that once again, you know, there's that constant sense of him blaming himself. In section 11, more about um, Lavender's death. Like cement, Kiowa whispered in the dark, I swear to God, boom, down, which is repeated from another section, the exact same words. And then another soldier says, yes, he was zapped while zipping. And then section 12, for the most part, they carried themselves with poise, a kind of dignity. Now and then, however, there were times of panic. And that panic typically had to do with the fact that they were afraid of dying, but they were even more afraid to show it. 
and so they found jokes to tell. They used a very hard vocabulary like zapped while zipping um, because it was stage presence. And they carried all this emotional baggage of men who might die. They carried the soldier's greatest fear, which was the fear of blushing. Men killed and died because they were embarrassed not to. So we're starting to see from this section, from this section, that they're carrying emotional baggage as well. We know they carry the weightiness of the actual objects, but they're also carrying the emotional baggage that goes with fighting in a war and specifically fighting in this type of a war. Then in the last section, again, we're told that Lavender was dead and that Cross burned Martha's letters and ultimately resolves that as the lieutenant, they would police up their acts and they would get their shit together and keep it together and maintain it neatly and in good working order. And then at the end, he vows to change the way that he leads this group of men. And then at the very end, he says they saddle up, form into a column, and move out toward the villages west of Tonkay, doing the same thing over and over and over again. So I guess the question is that I asked at the beginning of all this, all this text, all this evidence, is why is it significant that O'Brien structures his story this way? Well, I think for a couple of reasons. One is we're used to getting a linear narrative, which means we get first, second, third, we get a chronological story, right? This happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. Well, that's not what we get here. We get a very circuitous story with, it's like the story gets told, and then it gets told again, and then it gets told again, and then it gets told again. And you're, you're going in a circular motion. You're covering the same ground, maybe get a little bit more information, but it's the same story. And I bet many, I don't know if you are this way, but many readers get just like, oh my gosh, this is just repetitive. It's over and over and over again. Um, I just read about this. I know this. Why is he telling me this over and over and over again? Well, I think in large part is because he's trying to put us as readers into the what it would have been like to be a soldier there. And so the way that he communicates that is the sense that we did the same thing every day. It was the endless march. It was over and over and over again. And by telling his story this way, he puts the reader inside of it so that we can see the repetition, that we can feel the repetition that's going on, that endlessness of the march, um, the, that their days were the same over and over and over again. One of the things that's mentioned a couple of times in this story is the moral. And I think it's interesting and significant to kind of point out what that might be. So I'll read you the first time where we run across this concept of moral. This is right after, this is in section eight, where they carry things determined by superstition. And this is where we get that Norman Bowker carried a thumb that had been presented to him as a gift by Mitchell Sanders. The thumb was dark brown, rubbery to the touch, and weighed three ounces at most. It had been cut from a VC corpse, a boy of 15 or 16. They found him at the bottom of an irrigation ditch, badly burned, flies in his mouth and eyes. The boy wore black shorts and sandals. So here we have a soldier in shorts and sandals, showing you how difficult it was to know who the enemy was. At the time of his death, he'd been carrying a pouch of rice, a rifle, and three magazines of ammunition. You want my opinion, Mitchell Sanders said? There's a definite moral here. Henry Dobbins asked what the moral was. 
Moral, you know, moral. Sanders wrapped the thumb in toilet paper and handed it across to Norman Bowker. There was no blood. Smiling, he kicked the boy's head, watching the flies scatter. And it's like with that old TV show, Paladin, have gun, will travel. Henry Dobbins thought about it. Yeah, well, he finally said, I don't see no moral. And then... Mitchell Sanders responds, there it is, man. So we're, we're presented with this, well, what is this moral? What is the moral? I don't see one. And Mitchell Sanders goes, there you have it. There is no moral. There is no lesson. What is What this war is about is horrible. What they're doing is horrible. There's nothing to learn from. And then later you get this whole discussion of a moral mentioned again. And this is in the twelfth section. There it is, they'd say over and over. There it is. My friend, there it is. As if the repetition, or let me start a little above that. It's retelling this story of cutting off the thumb. They kicked corpses, they cut off thumbs, they talked grunt lingo, they told stories about lavender supply tranquilizers, how the poor guy didn't feel a thing, how incredibly tranquil he was. There's a moral here, said Mitchell Sanders. They were waiting for lavender's chopper, smoking the dead man's dope. The moral's pretty obvious, Sanders said, and winked. Stay away from drugs. No joke, they'll ruin your day every time. Cute said Henry Dobbins. Mind blower. Get it? Talk about wiggy. Nothing left, just blood and brains. They made themselves laugh. There it is, they'd say, over and over. There it is, my friend. There it is, as if the repetition itself were an act of poise, a balance between crazy and almost crazy, knowing without going. There it is, which meant be cool, let it ride, because, oh yeah, man, you can't change what can't be changed. There it is. There it absolutely and positively and fucking well is. So the moral is there is no moral, and you cannot change. And they were powerless and felt themselves in a pointless, hopeless situation. And then the point of the Martha storyline why is Martha brought into this story at all? Clearly, Cross feels like her presence in his life, which is not a real true presence at all, is distracting to him. So what does she represent? Does she represent um, hope of just being back home, of just a life that he's so separated from, so far away from, something that he is trying to cling to, to find some sanity in an insane situation. Um, there's other ways of looking at that. So just kind of think about why is Martha there? She's in every single section almost. And um, he blames himself for his preoccupation with her for killing Ted Lavender. Now, that's another question. Is it Cross's fault? And many people have different responses to that. And so that's up, that's up to you, I think, to decide. But I think this is an incredibly interesting story with some significant social and political statements here. The pointlessness of war, um, trying to make sense of something that is can't be made sense of, almost that same kind of question um, asked in the yellow wallpaper. What is one to do? These soldiers find themselves in these impossible situations and what are they to do?